Uh, what did you just think when they came to you with this matchup? Obviously, a guy you know with some hype behind him, doing well in the UFC so far. You see someone on your radar, and are you impressed with them? Uh, sure, I'm impressed with him. But you know, I don't really give a shit who it is. Everyone in the top fifteen is good. Uh, it's if it's not him, it's some other, you know, killer that uh, that's good at something else. You know, so uh, when I look at it, it's just it's all about game planning and finding ways to beat people. Obviously, uh, Song Yudong has a ton of hype behind him. This reminds me so much of the Tom Duke and Wa fight. Everything about it, the media, the questions I'm being asked, it's the same thing. I mean, it's literally almost uh, like it's like I'm having deja vu. Uh, and that was the same, same, you know, two to one underdog fighting a guy who was supposed to be the best thing since sliced bread. But I mean, I think people know by now that Americans are the best, like we're the best at, at MMA. We just are, um, besides a few outliers, like for the most part, everyone that's really good comes from America and, uh, even guys that aren't good come here to train. So, um, you know, I'm just going to give them a good old, uh, American ass open. Do you think uh, he's more dangerous than Tom, though, in certain ways? Obviously, he's shown pretty good knockout power. Yeah, sure. Tom, uh, you know, different different styles, obviously. You know, Song's more of a boxer. Tom is more of a kickboxer. But same thing, both dangerous finishers, um, both kind of untested when it came to the grappling aspect of MMA. Um, you know, I'm a hard guy to hit. I don't get hit with a lot of big shots. You know, I think my last fight I got hit with, like, three or four significant shots. So, uh Good luck landing the right hand on me. You mentioned kind of the patriotic slants of uh, you saying the Americans are the best. Is it a little more special to do it in the nation's capital then, especially since you've been here for a while? Uh, sure, sure, yeah. Uh, it's cool to be here, um, but it's not. It's not really. A, that wasn't really a, a shot at where he comes from because I mean, obviously I respect him and where he comes from, but it's just the truth. I mean, even he trains in the U.S. You know, Khabib trains in the U.S. Every single great champion ever has trained in the u.s you know so we just have the best mma gyms and coaching in the u.s so everyone ends up ends up being here that's just the truth on sign doesn't train here what's that israel has signed it doesn't train here. he's here a lot though <laughs> i'm at the pi all the time and i see him quite a bit so i like the pi oh it's amazing it's what amazing you? everything i mean from like a nutritional aspect they take care of everything i mean you're you're constantly checking your weight. You're constantly things are constantly being you know changed, added, subtracted uh, to your nutrition. Uh, I see uh, a physical therapist almost every single day. You know, five days a week. It's just every time there's a bump or bruise or anything happening, I go there. They take care of me. The next day it's okay. You know, so that way ing uh, injuries aren't lingering. You know, past a couple days. Uh, that and then you know the strength conditioning program is is, is surreal. It's kind of like uh, compared to uh, in the movie The Rocky, you go from training like Rocky, you know, in Michigan in the winter, shitty weather, to uh, like going to the PI where it's nice every day and, you know, they're putting you on basically some kind of machine where they're, you know, figuring out exactly what your heart rate should be, you know, and they build this huge program around it. It's actually, it's pretty surreal. It's awesome. It's amazing. It's been uh, a really good experience. What do you make of all this uh, movement to the Bantamweight division, right? Faber's back, Aldo's dropping down next week. Uh, Edgar's dropping down. We'll see how it goes with the injury, but um, still, injury. Well, uh, so just talk to my Phil and uh, I got his Korean zombie because he uh, oh. Brian Ortega got injured at one forty-five, so he might bump up. Oh, you know, so then, let's assume he fights. So they need somebody at thirty-five. Yeah, they might. I live in Las Vegas now, so they can feel free to give me a call. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to want a lot more money just so they know that up front. Uh, but I don't know. You know. It, and one aspect, I think it's amazing that I could potentially be fighting these guys that I, you know, consider to be, you know, legends of MMA, these guys that I've kind of looked up to throughout my uh, fighting career. And another aspect, I feel like these guys are really stretching and reaching for uh, anything, anything they can grab a hold of to stay relevant in the sport right now. And that's uh, like a hard thing for me to say because I have a ton of respect for these guys, but it's also the truth, you know. I don't know why Jose Aldo or Frankie Edgar would now decide to, at the very uh, you know last leg of their career, to go to 35. Maybe they think they have a shot. I just don't think they realize that. I think you know 35 might be the as far as talent goes the the deepest division. I mean, uh, in the UFC, I mean the only division that is uh, comparable, I think, would be 155. And I don't think it's a, ta a talent thing. I think it's more of a, a a name a name notoriety thing. People know. 55 pounders more, but I think 35 as far as the actual 
talent and skill level uh, of the weight class. I think it's the the deepest. So I think these guys are going to realize that maybe they should have stayed at a different weight class because they're going to have to fight not only you know guys that have been already proven themselves as you know great bantamweights, but guys that are trying to prove themselves as great bantamweights, and that's just as dangerous. He doesn't understand why he's not fighting you. You guys were kind of similarly lined up before, and then now you end up on the same card. Can you just address that from your perspective? Man, Rob Pond should just count his blessings. Count th he should just be thankful that he got Ricky Simone instead of me. Uh, honestly, I haven't heard Rob Pond's name since uh, since June. They, they they tried to book it again in August, and my my uh, my injury just wasn't healed in time. Um, and it was just going to be a situation like I'm not in a position where I need to like push an injury, and I'm not financially you know like I have to you know just fight no matter what happens to me. I've been smart with my money and <clears throat> I look at my career like a like a marathon, not a sprint. So I didn't need to fight Font. Obviously, you know, I'm I'm really upset about what happened with him. Um, you know, I was happy that they got John Lineker as a replacement and I was I was hoping to watch him fight. You know, because when you when you train as hard as Font and myself, you deserve to be able to go out there and, and display your skills. So I felt bad that he didn't get to fight. Uh, but you know his name really hasn't been brought up. You know, I don't really give two shits about Rob Font. I mean, honestly, like, who the fuck is Rob Font? He's already hit. I mean, nobody's saying Rob Font's the next guy to, you know, take the ball. No one's saying anything about Rob Font. I haven't heard shit about the guy. So, like, fighting Rob Font, is, he's completely irrelevant in my in my eyes. I mean, even when I got that fight, it was like, uh, okay, I'll fight Rob Font. It's going to be a nasty fight, but, you know, I'm going to whoop his ass. And then I'll fight someone that actually means something at the end of the year. And now I'm doing that. I just, you know, unfortunately didn't get injured and didn't get a paycheck for fighting rap out. Hey, um, when did you move to Vegas and what prompted that? Uh, August. And it was the injury. I mean, it was the injury and the combination of an injury and just feeling stale at home. Uh, you know, I I think we all kind of reach, reach these, these points in our career where, you know, uh, we need to grow. We need to grow. And I just... Uh, I just realized that I needed a, I needed a, maybe more consistently good training partners, and I needed to kind of simplify things. And the PI in Las Vegas kind of did that for me. It was just the combination of having everything in one place. The PI. I just I, I got so tired of running around and chasing training partners around in Michigan because there's only a handful of guys that are really talented enough. I feel like to push me, and just having to constantly be on the phone and constantly, you know, be the most motivated guy in the room is really really hard. To where now I go to Vegas and. And uh, you know, have I have you know amazing coaching staff and and uh, you know all these guys that have the same goal that I do. These guys all want to be the best in the world. So it's a different it's a different feeling. You know, every single day in the gym, I'm like, man, if I have I, and there was times this during this training camp where I had a bad day and I got my ass kicked. You know what I mean? Like that didn't happen back home. Like for the most part, I was always winning. You know what I mean? And that's and that's it doesn't you don't grow in that environment. And uh, you know, I really feel like as an athlete, I've, I've definitely made some. Blue, major major changes um just because i had to fight a lot more adversity you know through camp and uh it's made me a better athlete for sure are you just to clarify are you strictly a pi or where else are you no i saw it uh i trained with uh eddie Bracco. uh i train uh with casey at 10th planet jiu-jitsu i do pro practices extreme couture um you know i utilize the pi for strength conditioning and things outside of actual like skills training for MMA, but I mean, I bounce around to, you know, those, those, uh, those places. Uh, I just found, you know, what I think are the best practices and with the toughest guys around my weight class. And I just go to all those practices all week. Um, and honestly, it's, it's absolute, it's an insane grind. I'm still using, um, you know, I still use the coaches that I had back home. I didn't figure where I came from. Um, I still have the same boxing coach who's going to be in my corner. Um, you know, not not that much has changed. I've just kind of I haven't really subtracted anything. I've just added things is, to my training. Is the plan to continue with that kind of bouncing around, or do you want to moving forward maybe settle with uh, one gym, one team? That kind of well, I not no. See, I think that that's it's kind of a shit mentality for MMA, right? Hey, I'm going to train with this one team. Well, what if one day you know you go in there Thursday afternoon and you're going to pro practice? There's no dudes for you to work with, so you're just like what loyal to that team and instead of. You know what I mean? Well, why not go to the practice right down the road? You know, tenth tenth planet jiu jitsu with with Coach Casey is is literally you know three miles from my house. The PI is three miles from my house. Shrimp Couture is three miles from my house. So I can kind of coordinate with, 
you know, like guys like Joe Benavides and Tim Elliott and, you know, some other, you know, obviously some of the best guys in the world, guys in the top 10, and just like, hey, where are you guys going today? They tell me, I go there. You know what I mean? I just figure out where the best guys are going to be, and that's where I show up. And it kind of seems like a pretty simple recipe for success. You know what I mean? If you're going with the best guys in the world every day, like, you're either going to quit because you get your ass kicked consistently, or you're going to get better, and I've, I've gotten better.